technology. I'm trying really hard. All right, and then I got to turn this on. Okay, and then I got to turn my phone off. Okay. Good morning, church. Uh, quick announcement. Uh, if you're military, current, or veteran, please see Bobby Paskins in the lobby after service for a special thing he wants to put together. And uh, yeah, there it is. Oh, I should look at this. Okay, I'm getting it, Michael. I'm going to get this. So, guys, here's some family sharing. One of the daughters of this church took second place in a horse show. Yay! God really has provided. This has been so good for her. It's given Alyssa a lot of confidence. I just want to sh share that because it's a family, you know, celebration because she's a daughter of this church as much as she's a daughter of ours. Um, she did really well. It was six people in her particular uh, group. And, um, yeah, she took second. And she's only been riding, I think, since January and included a few things. The other thing I wanted to mention, you can see up there, Therapeutic Equestrian it's collaborative, but then it says the power of horses. There is a 5K run. I'm going to leave some flyers up here on the piano, and that's happening around Ashley Reservoir, I think right behind the Kingans, uh, on October 5th. She and I are going to do it. I'll put these here if anyone wants to do it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Amen. Okay, amen. So today I get to talk about something that has definitely, it's already been referenced and talked about, and that is generosity. And for those of you who don't know me, so my name is Lee Callen. I've been here. I made, I made Jesus Lord August 16th, 1990. was the summer before my junior year at UConn, baptized in a tub somewhere in New York. I don't, it's a little, like, foggy because I studied the Bible for two weeks and then uh, got baptized late, like, midnight in a big bathtub in New York somewhere. And uh, I've never looked back. Uh, a lot of ups and downs. And then... This is actually, I never got to go to church down there. It was just a whirlwind, and so this has been my home ever since. So uh, amen for that. So we're going to talk about generosity today, and, and I like how that's set out because the opposite would be the other end of the spectrum. We're starting this series on this idea of character. How do we emulate Christ's character? And Sajin talked about what on Wednesday? Integrity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Integrity, which is, it, which is really pivotal for your identity. Um, so we're going to go into generosity today. We're going to be looking in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 12. You can be turning there. Now, Luke is a really unique gospel because it's one of the synoptic gospels, meaning it shares a lot of stories with Matthew and Mark. But Luke is unique because most scholars don't think he was a Jew, that he was a Gentile. He actually was a physician that then was Paul's traveling companion. And he wrote the majority of the New Testament because he wrote Luke and Acts. I mean, go figure. But he paid a lot of attention to things that had to do with Judaism. So we can, we can think about that as we read. So as I said, there's, um, you know, you have this idea. I think you can have this. I always had this scarcity mindset. Can you identify with that? Growing up, for me, it was like, you know, I, it was tough. It was not easy. So anything I earned, you know, would go toward whatever the family needs were, including my own. Versus an abundance mindset, you know, where it's just like, wow, that's the other extreme. But I think that scarcity mindset really led me to greed. Even though I didn't have much, what I had, I was just greedy about. Versus the other extreme of when you feel like there's abundance, you're able to be generous. Not always, but I think you're more in a position, if that's your mindset, whether you have a lot or not. And I'm not just talking about money. So we're going to be looking at Luke... Uh, chapter 12, and I want to give us the backdrop to this because I think that's always important. Here Jesus is around a crowd of thousands. And so we're going to, we're going to get to the rich fool today, but he's around a crowd of thousands. Pharisees, teachers of the law, that's what it, is the backdrop to this. And he just lambasted the Pharisees with the six woes. Woe to you! Woe to you! And he kind of concludes, I'm sorry, he introduces that section. I'll just read this in uh, Luke uh, chapter 11, verse 39 to 41. It says, Then the Lord said to them, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean 
for you. He's really trying to show them that it's an inside out transformation. You can do all these external things and not change one bit on the inside. Have you had that experience? You're like, I, got, I, I never want to do this again, or I, I want to be able to do this and not fall prey to this. And it's exhausting because we're going on our own strength. Jesus transforms from the inside out. And then you can run. You can really change. That's how Jesus works. But we need him to change our hearts. So that's the backdrop. Then there's thousands of people after he leaves this scene with the Pharisees. The, the, the point, too, is you know he gave the Pharisees the time of day. You know, he didn't spend time with everyone, so he did have a heart for the Pharisees. I think sometimes we can feel like, oh, he's always down on them. He really did care for them, and he spent time with them. So then we come up uh, after this passage. He, he sets the tone by saying, be generous. So I want to I give us a framework to work within. So who has ever um, done house-sitting for someone? Raise your hand if you've done house-sitting. Okay, how about, put your hand down. Now, what if you've had your house sat? Have you had, <laughs> have you had someone sit your, okay. So you get this mindset. I think about house-sitting, especially like when you're younger and you didn't have a house, and someone says, oh, can you, you know, watch my house for the weekend? And they, they have like a pretty nice house. You're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I totally can. I can do that. Okay, what do I got to do? You know, do the plants, you know, take, take in the mail, take out the trash. You know, and I think it's interesting. When you're, when you're in someone's house and they're not there, right, <laughs> you're like checking it out. You're like, oh, let me look at these pictures. Oh, what kind of books do they read? Oh, what kind of food did they buy? Wow, a lot of carbohydrates in this house. <laughs> I don't think Jenny Allen would be happy about this. And then... <laughs> And then you're kind of going around, you know, maybe you're like, oh, yeah, that, that jacket fits really good. I knew we are about the same frame. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. But you're house sitting, and, and you, you know, let's say they're gone for a while. You start to get comfortable there, right? And then they come back, and they got their bags, and they come up to you, and they're like, yeah, everything's great. You know, not, nothing broke. Everything's great. It's all set. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, okay, great. Thank you. And then you're just like still sitting there. And they're like, OK, that's great. So yeah, no, I'm so happy. I love being here. It's so great. Thank you. And then they're like, you know, you've done your job. So you know, great to see you. And it gets awkward if all of a sudden it's like, well, no, I actually moved my stuff in. I really feel that this is where I should be. And I just have a little corner in the living room. You won't even notice me. You know, please just let me have that corner. It's like the Hurley he uh, voice. Let me just have the corner of your living room. You won't even notice me. It's not your house. <laughs> Get out of my house. <laughs> so it would be, would be a little awkward, but it's a framework. So here's the thing I want us to think about, church. There's only one thing I want you to walk away with today. In our lives, we are only house-sitting. Thank you. We're only house-sitting change of perspective. We need to remember that. I've asked uh, Al to read uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through, I'm sorry, tw- uh, 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, Self, you have plenty of grain led up, laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be. Thank you, Al. Appreciate that. It's a striking passage. Very interesting passage. Jesus, what did Jesus speak the most about? Does anyone know? 
Money was number two, way up there. The I couldn't hear you. Storing up things. Actually, the kingdom is what he talked about first. Money was, was second, definitely, so really high in the list. Why money? Except that I think it's a barometer for the heart in a lot of ways. The way we allocate our resources tells a lot about what we're hoping for. So there's four things I want us to reflect on as we go through today's, um, today's uh, sermon, and that is this. Number one, how we live reflects what we're living for, what we hope for. How we live reflects what we think we own. Your relationship to your possessions, and that's material and that's relational. That could be your spouse, your children, significant other, your dog, uh, reflects how you view them. And then lastly, our security reveals what we truly believe about God. So think about these things as we go through this today. You know, Luke is, is brilliant because he emulates a structure that's found through a lot of Hebrew writers. Uh, and, of course, he's recording Jesus' words by his research. And so we're going to look at the passage the way it breaks down. I know it's hard to see. I couldn't fit it all in. But I think you can get a general idea of the structure. So this is what's called, uh, it's, a, it's a parallelism, in this case, inverted parallelism or ring composition. And what that simply means is the, the solution or the climax is in the center of the passage. It's not at the end. So that's why I have the letters A, B, C, D, C, B, A, because of the way this, this bridges and, and is presented. And that's a common technique in Hebrew writing. And Jesus used it for this parable that he presented which I think is really interesting to, to note. You know, I think that in this passage, um, just to set the background even a little more, the fact that he, it's a crowd of thousands, and I, I don't know if Jesus was taking questions at that point, but for someone to say, Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Uh, yeah, we're not talking about that today, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, and then he felt compelled to go into this, this parable. Uh, but you see what was on his heart. What an awkward thing to bring into that. Then he breaks it down, and he, and he levels this warning. And he just ends that passage with saying, this is how it will be if you're storing things up for yourself and not for God. You know, I think for Jesus, he was saying, why would you not? He says, I, you're calling me a judge. I'm not the one to divide this together, you know, from you and your brother. And what was the, his primary concern? I want my stuff. I want what I deserve. Our father has passed. The older brother gets two-thirds. I should get my third. Why wouldn't I get it? And he's not concerned about the breach in the relationship, which is exactly what Jesus was concerned about the breach in the relationship. So problem number one, and, and you, see these, you see these pairings. The man, he had already decided what the right outcome was. He decided what should happen. And then we'll talk about a second problem. But when we look at this, and you see in verse 16, he says, okay, here's goods that were abundant. Goods were given. And then in verse 17, he thinks to himself. There's the soliloquy. He's talking to himself in the passage. What should I do? And that becomes paired with verse 19. I'll say to myself, you have plenty. And then, of course, it culminates with when he says, I know what I'll do. There's the solution. This is what I'll do. I'm going to tear my barns down, build bigger ones. Now, did, this, did he need more? Because we already know what about him, that he was a... He was a rich man. He thought he needed more to take life easy. It wasn't enough. And he thought, in this, in this passage, Jesus points out, you know, you already think, as the man brings the question, what the solution is. That, that's a problem. Problem number one. You know, do we do this with God sometimes? It doesn't go a certain way? Or I can't, an ex I can't accept an alternative outcome? And I could begin to doubt, to doubt God's presence or God's justice or God's provision. It didn't go the way I expected. This was supposed to happen. So clearly God is not hearing or seeing or he's not capable to meet the need or he doesn't care. Is that consistent with God's character? Because we've got to remind ourselves. So many instances I can think about where it didn't go that way. 
but it was even better was the outcome. And you've heard me share some of those stories about Nathan's school, about a job I got, about things with Alyssa. It's amazing. It happens again and again. So now I just pray, God, reveal what it should be because I don't know what's best. I think it should be this. But let me suspend judgment. Do we do this with God? Problem number two. Problem number two is the directive the man offers assumes what? It assumes that he thinks he's right. That's what it assumes. This is what needs to happen. Are you open, church? Are you open to a different perspective on your relational conflicts? To maybe owning more than seems fair in the relational conflict? You see, church, because our security in God directly correlates to our ability to own more. Because you know what? Maybe, maybe Ed owes me you know, $10, and I'm like, man, he still hasn't paid me. Ed, where's my $10? But you know what? If I'm relying on God, I'm like, God's going to give me even more. I'm not going to let that stand in between our relationship. Right. I'm not going to worry about that. He can have the $10. I want his friendship. He's my brother. I will gladly give him another 10 and God will take care of the rest. So we, we think about this, this man crying out, divide the inheritance. Jesus saying, let me tell you a story. And let me, help to, let me help you find yourself in this story. This would be a depiction of the rich man by Rembrandt. And he's looking at all his accounting and all of his goods. How does Jesus ultimately respond in verse 15 to the man? He says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions or Take heed of insatiable desire is another translation. Because you can have an insatiable desire toward all kinds of things. It can be money, like, oh, I'll be secure if I only have this much. I'll be set. Oh, no, I need this much, actually, and then I'll be set. No, you know what? That's not going to be enough. i got to get this much. Or relationally, you know, you need to be this for me. Or you can do that on any number of levels. Or maybe on your career path. If I get to this level, then I'll be good insatiable desire. And Jesus says, watch out. Be on your guard. Possessions are bonded to a deep, often irrational fear, a fear of one day not having enough. The gnawing fear presses frail humans to acquire more and more. There is never enough because only God can fill this eternal void, which made me think of that passage in Ecclesiastes 9. What do the workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people to do than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is a gift from God. It's a gift, church. It's not a wage. It's a gift, and we can often feel like, I deserve this. This is owed to me. I'm so disciplined. I'm so diligent, and I've done this on my own. And the fact is, is we've done nothing on our own. We've been given so much. An eternal void that only can be filled by an eternal God. Life is not found in the surpluses sought by these desires. Furthermore, if God is the gift giver, of all things, what rights do we have to the surpluses that we sometimes encounter, what we think our own hands have exclusively produced? After all, we are only house sitters. That's right. House for sale. House for sale. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. This is a great deal. 16 Boardman Ave, Manchester. Ooh, that's on the water. That's a great zip code, by the way. Uh, eight beds, almost as many baths, 14,000, almost 15,000 square feet. I mean, I wanted 15,000, but anyway, it used to be 11 million. It's been marked down to 7.2 million. This is a great deal, guys. Someone should take advantage of this house for sale. Why am I bringing this up? Well, uh, a few years ago, we vacationed in Beverly, and we stayed at the old Morse estate, not this house that I'm about to show you, and um, it was a great time. It was what we needed. We were having a tough summer medically with our daughter, so we needed to be near a medical center, and it was close. 
and we also wanted to be on the water. So we canceled our other plans. This came through through prayer, and we were able to stay at a place very proximal to this. So this is just satellite view. So here we are. So we're in between Gloucester and Beverly, just to give you a rough idea. And um, really interesting thing happened. One day, as you can see, we, um, we were making our way to the beach. And so our place was up here, which I'm not showing. But we could come down, cross the tracks, and then hang out on this beach. And Amy Trout's parents met us, Terry and, and uh, his wife met us there, which was awesome. We're hanging out. But then as we're over here in this section, there is like this music that is cranking. I mean, it is so loud. And it's, I mean, it was 70s rock. So, you know, I, I like 70s rock. I mean, this is, <laughs> I enjoy that. But when they're playing, you know, over and over, over, and over again, um, what's that? Uh, play that funky music, white boy. Over <laughs> and over and over. I think that was one of the songs, wasn't it? So one of the songs. It was so loud. So, you know, of course, I'm just like, wow, this is, this is wrecking the whole day. So, um, so my wife says, she says, you need to go over and tell them to turn it down. I was like, like, who? <laughs> She's like, wherever it's coming from. I'm like, it's all like multi-million dollar mansions. She's like, here, take your daughter. It'll help. <laughs> So I did. So I got closer and closer, and I found I got closer. So that was the place, all right? So it was low tide. Otherwise, I would have had to kayak over there uh, or, or, or swim. I don't know. I, so we walk in here. We come up, and I'm thinking the first thing, I'm like, oh, there's going to be Doberman Pinchers. <laughs> We're going to get attacked. <laughs> I better put her on my shoulders. I'm like, oh, man, there's probably snipers in the trees. So we come in this way, and it's just blaring. Play the funky music, white boy. And it's insane. And I come this way, and then I'm like, oh, look at that. Oh, they got a really nice pool. Oh, look at this. They got a, a full outdoor kitchen with seating. And guys, right here, kid you not, mini golf. What? Yeah. I didn't have a ball on me, but I would have played. So I'm going this way. We're kind of slinking around. And finally, I'm going this way because I'm not finding anybody. Nobody. So finally, I come up this way with Alyssa. We're coming around. We get here. There was three cars in the driveway at the time. First one was a Lexus. The next one was a Mercedes. And the third one was a Maserati. So the Lexus, I'm guessing, is for grocery trips or, you know. <laughs> I don't know. So we finally get over here, and I see someone. And I see this guy look up like, what are you doing on my property? And so he looks up, and it ended up being one of the groundskeeper, the groundskeeper, the only human I saw. I'm like, hey, hey, listen, it's just, it's so deafening loud. You wouldn't believe how loud it is because sound carries on the water, and it was so loud. And he says, oh, oh, yeah, the old man. I said, old man? He's like, ah, he's, he lost his hearing. You know, he doesn't have much hearing left, so he plays it really loud. I'm like, well, who else is here? He's no one. He's the only guy there. This amazing place. And it just made me think, the more wealth you acquire, the poorer you can become relationally. It doesn't have to be, but in this case, it seemed that way. The more wealth you can acquire, the more distant and isolated you can become. No recognition that the bumper crop was a gift from God. Do we recognize those gifts? No thought of how to responsibly use it because this rich man, he saw it as exclusively his. He was already rich, but he still saw it as his. And then he speaks only to himself. This is a problem, church. This is why we're in community. You know, this week, Ryan and I were trying to help plan something, and, um, or I'm sorry, Phil and I were planning something for Dan Therrien, who's getting married today. Amen. <laughs> Exciting. Uh, tonight out in Harvard, Mass. But um, something came up, and Ryan called me. He says, bro, can I just run this by you? Because I don't feel like I can do this and this and this. I just want to get some input. I said, yeah, I, I think you probably shouldn't go, Ryan. I think you've got too much going on. But because of that phone call, it caused me and Phil to totally change what we were doing. And the night for Dan went way better. It was Ryan's phone call seeking advice for himself.
that changed the whole night. Nothing happens in isolation, church. We're in relationships for a reason. It's not one-dimensional. It's not all about us. So let's be family. Let's, de let's default. Let's, you know, really go to one another and defer that way. This man had a fundamental misunderstanding of what a proper relationship to material things was. He had a misguided life, and he had misjudged life, and where contentment were truly found. He didn't understand what would truly sustain him, nor did he even reflect on the ultimate gift that he had been given, his very life, his very breath. We're going to look at a couple of Greek words here uh, for a second. But, church, do you see not only your possessions, material, and relational as gifts, but also your very own life as a gift to use for God? Or do you think it's just for you? It's interesting when he says this in verse 19, I'll say to myself, and it ends with, you know, eat, drink, and be merry. That word merry, euphrano in the Greek, basically is like, ah, I've arrived. And then what does Jesus say? You fool, which is afran in the Greek, means without reason, but the base word is fron, which is like regarding breath, like diaphragm, diaphron. And he says, you've lost your breath. You're without breath because your life is going to be taken, you fool. He was, he was to discover that his very life was not his own but was on loan. Sadly, he sought to be filled with created things instead of the creator. Now, I think Jesus reveals the even deeper problem, and I've asked Jan to read uh, Luke 12, verses 22 through 34. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? Man, thank you, Jan. So I think Jesus really then segues into what the deeper problem is. What do we think about the Father? Who is God really to you? And does that change? Because God says, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. I am not changing. I am always gracious. I am always giving, merciful, abundant. God's provision is always abundant. You know, there's another whose life was demanded from him, except it wasn't a surprise. No, he actually was determined to give it up, determined to drink the cup, and then fully empty himself. In Luke 23, verse 46, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last, and he gave up his breath for us so that we could take God's breath back in and live for all eternity. Reflect on this today, church. I... I feel really moved and privileged to be able to share these things. And I want to end with a, a little story, and then we're going to conclude uh, this, this message. There was a master of a house, a grand house. The master was going away for a time and needed a house sitter. He found a trusted individual and gave him full charge of the house and all the resources associated with it. He trusted him because he believed that the house sitter would carry on in the same way as the master. But when the master returned, he was surprised 
with what he found out. He said to the house sitter, why are you the only one here? I thought you would have had others over to enjoy the house. I don't understand why it's locked up so tightly. Everything looks exactly the same as I left, as if it wasn't shared. The pantry is full. Even some of the food is spoiling. The individual responded, somewhat bewildered. Oh, oh yes, I, I did have people over at first, but I worried that the resources here would run out. And then what would I do? The master replied, didn't you know that I had arranged for everything to be replenished? Should the resources ever run low? Surely you knew that my only concern was that you be generous, for after all, my purpose has always been to be a father to the fatherless, to defend the widows, set the lonely in families, and lead those enslaved into abundant freedom. Church, the master calls us to pour out ourselves, to use every resource and gift we've been given, to bless others, to call them into his house, to use even our very own lives, to be generous house sitters. And for those who wonder if they can come in, he doesn't lock the door. No, he waits. He waits. He watches. He looks for those in the valley of decision. He looks. So many look up at that grand house on the hill but they feel they would never be able to enter because of their insecurity, worried that perhaps they're not worthy, or maybe living in hesitancy because they don't know what kind of master he is. Stand no longer at the door. Come in and sit with the master. Spend time and see how he is first and foremost a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, one who longs to set the lonely in families, and one who always leads us out of slavery into abundant freedom. Ask those here today who you believe have spent time with the master, the house sitters who, like the master, are generous and eager to open their house to you. Amen, church. One more time for Lee. I love uh, how Lee has that spirit of a teacher. You know, helps you to go deeper into maybe what you feel like you already know, but helps you to understand it in, deep, in a deeper way. Uh, please stand. We're going to have one last song. Uh, following this song, we're going to have a restoration.